All right. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Eric Olson, and I've been invited to talk a bit about a cool discovery I made in Costa Rica a bunch of years ago now. And um, I was asked first to talk a bit about um, my sort of path in life and uh, how I ended up here in Waltham. I live in Waltham, where you guys do too, I guess. And and um, uh, I'm quite near to Brandeis University, where I was teaching for a bunch of years. And um, so what I think I, I will do is just tell you a bit about the fact right some of the some of the things that are relevant to this my current job or that I just retired by the way and I'm moving to Nicaragua soon so that's very exciting I'll miss Waltham but I am heading south and um so I've always been interested in bugs I just since I was a little kid and I I think that's a really important part of the story um, I could actually show a bit of the slides right away to tell you a little bit about my path. So why don't we, uh, why don't we go to those? And uh, the main point of this meeting, though, is to tell you about a most amazing spider. So first a little bit about me and then a bit about this amazing spider. So I'm going to share the screen. And um, this is going to be a story of plant eating ants and the spider that steals their food. And the name of the spider is cool. It's Bagheera Kiplingi. And those of you who know the Jungle Book will remember that Bagheera was the best friend of Mowgli, the protector of Mowgli. And the name has not absolutely nothing to do with the spider's life, but it was just given by some you know, fun scientists long, long time ago. And so um, here's me at two years old in uh, in Texas, and I'm already doing the biology stuff. You can see I'm already, you know, very attracted to living things. And this fisherman neck near near me here in the picture had caught a fish, and he he had it in a bucket, and so I was identifying it, fish. And um, uh, I, some of you may be interested to know that I wasn't like an awesomely great student. I'm a scientist now with a PhD. Oh boy, I must have been good at school all the way through. No, that isn't the way it always works. Um, I think it might be easier to be really good in school all the way through, and I, I recommend it if you can, but um, uh, that isn't, wasn't my path. I went to, um, I, I did get into college though, and did okay there. But after college, I took time off from going on and I moved to South America and I taught school in a private school in South America. And that really changed everything. I um, uh, really fell in love with the tropical forest. And so when I came back to the United States, here's my, there's college, a bachelor's degree in geology and I particularly studied fossils. But when I came back from my trip to South America, I went back to the school and got a, um, a master's degree in forestry. And I figured out when I was doing my master's degree that, oh my gosh, I can be a good student. And I did really well in my master's program. And so that convinced me I could actually go on and, and do a PhD. And, and remember, I'd always loved bugs. And so I, I, having discovered I could be a good student, I decided to, um, to uh, uh, really delve into the world of insects. And I studied um, the diet of a caterpillar. Uh, you know how, us, how researchers will use like fruit flies to study genetics? They don't, there's nothing special in particular about fruit flies. Every organism has chromosomes but fruit flies are particularly easy to study for their chromosomes. And in the similar way, this moth was particularly easy to work with. And it had, I was able to ask some good questions about the evolution of insect diets. I should also say something about failure, I think. The reason I went to South America was partly because my silly girlfriend broke up with me and I was very upset. But um, it turned out that that was, that was around age 23. And I was uh, 
you know, very heartbroken for a, a little while, but there's something about that opportunity when you have a crisis that can really affect your life in a good way. So sometimes you'll hit barriers or bumps in the, in the road, but it may well be a, opening a door to a new world. And that's what happened to me. I went to South America and I've never looked back. I've always been a tropical biologist ever since. So um, we jump forward now to after finishing my PhD in Costa Rica, I decided to do a study of tropical ecology that required a lot of person power. So I got funding from Earthwatch and Earthwatch is this really cool group that sends you volunteers. So here's me, there's me right there in the middle with my daughter at the time, she's all grown up now. Um, and here's my group of volunteers and the volunteers come from all over the world. Um, this dude's from Boston. Uh, this guy was from New York. He was from Texas. There's some Brits in here, some Australians, a couple more folks from Boston. Um, it was a really diverse group. And I'd get five of these teams a year and they helped me with my research. But one day they came to me in the afternoon. Some of them came to me and said, you know, Eric, it's really fun to be helping you out like this, but the lab work in the afternoon gets really tedious. Do you ever, we'd like to be back outside. Could we do anything back outside? And I said, well, you know, I've been thinking of doing this survey of jumping spiders. And I could teach you how to collect jumping spiders as a little side project. And they said, yeah, let's do that. So this is the story. <laughs> I didn't know what we would find, but I just figured jumping spiders are really pretty and maybe there'll some neat story, you know, coming out of them. So I have to say the volunteers really got this going and thank you very much volunteers. And so here's just why I chose to study jumping spiders as a little side project. They're just really colorful. They're weird. This is an ant up here and that is a spider. Count the legs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Count the legs of the ant. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's a spider, dudes. And so it's just amazing the mimicry. Um, they, 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 they have, you know, this one, oh, and th this one actually is a mimic too. It's an ant, a velvet ant that stings. Um, they have really cool vision. They have these telescopes in their head that can, um, that can swivel around and they can see color and motion. They're some of the best eyes in the animal kingdom, along with human, you know, mammals, birds, octopuses, and jumping spiders. Those are some of the best eyes in all the world. Um, this one feeds milk to its young. That's a whole story. You have to look it up. Um, yeah, the milk feeding spider. I mean, they're just bizarre. And here's a gorilla of a spider. This is one of the males. Um, that's male and female. That's another ant mimic. There's male and female. Um, there, and I had this illustrator who's doing great work. She's just an amazing illustrator. It's just a very diverse group. There's 6,000 species. It's the biggest group of spiders in the world. And, uh, and just super interesting animals. Um, and so the volunteers wanted to collect these jumping spiders. So I taught them this real simple method using a sheet held open, kind of like a kite. And you just beat on the branches and, and spiders and ants fall on the sheet and you can search and collect the, the jumping spiders. But I told them, don't collect off this tree. It's got terrible stinging ants and your arms will be covered with welts from the stings. Well, one day I looked at the vials and it said, jumping spider collected on ant acacia. And that's what this plant is called. It has these stinging ants. And I, and I called them over. I said, you know, uh, Barbara, come over here. I told you guys, you really can't collect spiders on the ant acacia. You're gonna get stung. And they said, well, we didn't beat the sheet. Uh, we didn't beat the plant, we just noticed the ants and thought they were cool and we watched them a little while and then we saw this jumping spider so we collected it on, in a vial. So they did it in a way they wouldn't be stung. And I thought that's impossible. There can't be a spider living with the ants. But the next year it happened again. And that was the same spider and we didn't find the spider anywhere else in all our collections of these thousands of spiders we were collecting. And so 
that made me wonder. And we decided to go out and look, my illustrator and I, and we went out and really, really looked. And that's where we saw the, um, the spider doing its thing. But this is what you normally see on this plant. Here are the ants and they're collecting a little nectar. And you see the big thorn there, the plant grows thorns and the ants hollow out the thorns. They can scoop out the inside of the thorn and they um, have their queen lives inside one of the thorns and lays eggs. And the ants raise all the babies inside these hollow thorns. And the ants patrol the plant and they sting anything that lands on the plant, any caterpillar or grasshopper or even a deer or cow that tries to nibble on the plant gets terrible stings from the ants. So the plant gives them a place to live and the ants protect the plant, but also see that ant in the red circle? The, it's, see these little orange blebs? these little melons on the tips of the young leaves, that's what the plant feeds to the ants in order to keep them all going. They, the ants harvest these and feed them to their babies in the thorns. And the whole colony grows, the plant grows, the ants don't eat anything except for those little melons. And, and that's their life. So it's an ant plant mutualism. The ants protect the plant with their fierce stings and the plant feeds the ants with these little melons. And this story I did not discover. This has been known since the 1800s. And so, but look at this. What's that? There's a spider living on the plant too, which, which is the spider story you're hearing about. And, and people had noticed spiders on the plants before, but they'd never paid attention to them. They always just figured, oh, they're trying to eat the ants or something. And so this is the story of Bagheera kiplingi, the omnivorous spider that parasitizes a neotropical mutualistic symbiosis. There's a lot of syllables. It just means that it lives on the plant and it actually steals the food that the plant is providing for the ant. So here's what a spider will often be found doing, watching the ants, because the ants can hurt the spider if it catches them. And the ants chase the spider whenever they spot it, but the spider's eyes are so good. They can always uh, keep away from the ants. Here's an ant feeding on a little bit of nectar from one of the, um, the little tiny pits on the stem are producing a sugary water to keep the ant full of energy. And the spider waits when the ant goes away, it runs up and drinks from the energy rich nectar. And then if it does get caught on a leaf, it will like, uh, try to frighten the ant and, you know, uh, threaten it. And if it's just one ant versus one spider, the ant will go away. Um, and then the spider can go back to its business of being a little thief. And so the spider waits its turn. And when no one's looking, it goes up and grabs the food of the ants. And so this was the first recorded instance of a spider that eats from a plant. It's called the vegetarian spider in um, popular, you know, the popular name is the vegetarian spider. And uh, it's not quite right <laughs> because in addition, remember that the ants are grazing, raising their babies in the thorns. Well, sometimes the ants have to carry their baby from one thorn to another. And when that happens, the spiders pounce and grab the babies and run. So the spider is stealing the ants food and killing their babies and eating their babies. It's really quite wicked <laughs> what it's doing. And I actually had, the, uh, there was a story in the Boston Globe about this spider and a man wrote into the science writer of the Globe and said, that's not a vegetarian spider, it's killing the ant babies. And <laughs> she wrote to me and said, how would you respond to this? And I said, well, you know, the word vegetarian really refers to humans that mostly eat plants or only eat plants. So we're already playing a little fun with the name. If an insect only eats plants, it's called an herbivore, not a vegetarian. And we all know that some vegetarians eat fish, um, some even eat chicken, some eat eggs, 
and you know, so animal products are often part of a vegetarian's diet. That's just this. It's just like every now and then it grabs a baby. It's all right, right? It's still uh, mostly a plant eating spider, which is pretty amazing. So we tried to, we decided to do some studies of this and looked at exactly what it was doing. And you can see here that, you know, most of the time it's eating these, these melons. That's its food. It occasionally eats babies. It sips nectar. Every now and then it actually grabs another insect, like a little fly that lands in front of it. But mostly it's feeding on those little melons. So it really is mostly this weird thing called a plant eating spider. Um, and let's see, I can tell you a little bit more about some of the things it's doing. And what I'll do is um, just move down the slides a second here and show you the um, uh, nesting behavior. Oh, this was kind of a neat story. And uh, we looked at, you know, how does the, how does the question, how does the, uh, what happens when the, oh, sorry, what happens when the um, spider gets on the wrong plant? We'll look at that. And what we did is we, you know, th this is a spider that depends so intensely on this one plant. So we looked at this question of what happens if a spider finds itself on the wrong plant? Does it just become a normal spider and start looking for bugs? And what happens is if it's, if you put it from one antacacia to another, it rarely tries to get away. It just uh, it very rarely stays happy on its new, um, or it stays happy right away on its new plant. Here you can see does not disperse. 10 out of 12 times, it did not try to move to another plant. But if you put it on a plant that doesn't have the ants and all their food and all their babies and everything, 11 out of 12 times, they immediately leave that plant and start looking for their, their favorite kind of plant. So this test showed us that this spider really is specialized on this one plant. And that's why we never found it anywhere else in all of our surveys of, um, of other spiders. And we tested that with, um, we tested that with uh, a little statistics. Here's where they make their nest to lay their eggs. They find an old leaf that doesn't have a lot of ants patrolling it. And that's where they'll, um, they'll live when they, when they um, are going to be like, you know, molting from one stage to another or about to lay their eggs on the plant. And so um, that's really the, the story of this remarkable spider. It, um, it did get into the New York Times. And it even got on to National Public Radio with the radio show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And they, if you've ever listened to that radio show, you remember that they make limericks. So I'll finish this presentation with a limerick and see if you guys can, you're supposed to guess the last word of the limerick. Are you ready? They had mothers, I often repeat, but my friends kick me with their eight feet. No bugs in my diet. I say they should try it. Um, I'm a spider that does not eat meat. Thank you very much.